what we're going to be looking at today is the new birth. Uh, let's start in, in the book of John and in chapter 3. We'll start at the beginning of the verse, or the beginning of the chapter. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we look into your word today, we ask that you would guide us, teach us those things which are important to us, those things you would want us to know, that we might be better servants for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Jesus said... In verse 3, verily, verily, I say unto you, wait a minute. Okay. Um, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus says it is necessary to be born again. Why? Why must we be born again? All right, let's to begin to find out why we must be born again. Let's turn back to the book of Genesis, way back to the beginning. And in Genesis chapter 2, the God had just created man. And in chapter 2, and starting with verse 8, he says, now well, let's back up before that. Um, wait a minute. I was in the wrong chapter. Okay. Yes, chapter 2, verse 8. And the Lord planted and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made, God made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then drop down to verse 15. And the Lord God took man whom he, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden of thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, when God created man, he made man sinless. And man had perfect fellowship with God. Now he says, I give you one commandment. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Only thing that he commanded. But, man, well, we, we all know the story how Satan came to Eve and says, has God said? And he says, then he Flat out, flat out calls God a liar. He says, God knows that the day that you eat thereof, he says, your eyes will be open and you will be as God's knowing good and evil. And it says that it's when Eve saw that the tree was good and would make one wise, she took of it and ate. Now what happened? 
It said that in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, there are two ways to look at that. Number one, instantly they died physically, or not physically, they died spiritually. So on the day they ate of it, they died spiritually, and there was a, a barrier put between them and God. Now, another way to look at it is, it says, in the day thou eat there, that you eat of it, you will surely die. Up until that time, man would have lived forever. But when they ate of it, they began, the death process began when they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They began to die now. It took them over 900 years to accomplish the actual physical death. But we see two, two aspects of it there. Number one, the spiritual. They died spiritually at that point. Now, what happened to them? Well, before they had, it was what many call it, they were in a state of untried innocence. They had, God put them to a test. Before that, they were innocent before God. When, they, when the test came, they failed the test, and then there was a barrier. There was a, a division between man and God. And man, at that point, became a sinful being. Now, as we look at, look at things throughout history, the first thing we think of, who was the first person born? It was Cain, of course. And what was Cain? Cain was a murderer. The first man that was born rose up and killed his brother. Now, this, this is a sad commentary on the human race, is it not? And so man progressed until we come up to the point where God said, see if I've got this here. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took of them wives of which all of which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, because for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the in the earth in those days, and also after that the sons of men came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, from creeping thing in the fowls of the air, or repented me that I had made them. So as time passed by, probably about 2,000 years from the creation, it came to the point where men were so wicked on the earth that God says, I can't, I can't let them live anymore. It's just too much wickedness, too much violence. And he says, I'm going to have to destroy man that I've made. But fortunately, there was one man who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God preserved the human race through Noah. But he had to destroy all the other people on the earth because of the wickedness of their hearts. And so he purged it down, but we had one godly man and his, his three sons, and they began to remultiply, the, began, began to replenish the earth. And you think, well, they've had a good example. They'll, they'll, they'll live right now. Uh -uh. And it then became wicked again. And the God, then they, next we come to the, where people were, we're going to do what we want to do with the, the build a tower. They were going to use it to worship 
the stars of heaven. And many people think that this tower was for astrology, uh, which may be the case, but it was something God said you shouldn't do. And God told them to, to, to fill the earth, but they stayed in one place. And so God had to come down and he, he confounded the languages and scattered the people. And the more people congregate together, the more wickedness seems to multiply. If we look at, at the cities, the big cities seem to be the most wicked. You go out into a rural area and you, things seem to be, for the most part, more peaceful. But yeah. you, you get into places where people are packed together and you, it just seems that wickedness multiplies. Well, then we come down again and God chooses out of people. God chose Abraham. And God said, I know that Abraham will, will instruct his children and, and bring them up in the way of the Lord. But let's look at this chosen people. We come down to, to Jacob and his 12 sons, and there was a big famine, and they were taken into Egypt. And to begin with, they were doing good in Egypt, but then it says that a new king arose after that knew not, jo that knew not Joseph. And he put, put the children of Israel to terrible bondage, and they, they became slaves. And the people cried to God, God help us, God help us. And so God raised up Moses who led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he put plagues to the Egyptians and, to, and he destroyed Egypt. And the, and the people saw this. And then they left and Pharaoh says, let's go after them. We can't let them get away. So the the people came to the Red Sea and they were, were closed in and they had Pharaoh on one side and the Red Sea on the other side and they couldn't go anywhere. And they started complaining. And Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of God. And all night, the, the wind blew and it, it opened up the Red Sea and the children of Israel walked through on dry ground. And the Egyptians, who were held off up until this point, came in after them. The Israelites stepped on the dry ground, and then the, the waters came back together and drowned the Egyptians. And all this the children of Israel saw. They had the testimony. God was with them. God delivered them over and over and over. What happened? God called Moses to go up into the mountain. For 40 days and 40 nights, he was in the, up in the mountain. And God delivered him to him the Ten Commandments. But what happened in the meantime down in the camp? People came to Aaron, Moses' brother, and says, We don't know what happened to Moses. He's gone. Make us gods to lead us back into Egypt, and we'll serve the Egyptians again. They delivered, they were delivered, they were delivered. Now they say, make us gods. Just in the heart of man to do evil. Whatever God says, he turns a man, turns his way, his back on God, and it goes, reverts back to evil. This is the result of the fall of man. Let's look at another testimony in the book of Psalm, verse, uh, chapter 14, the first verse. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. 
They are all gone aside. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And then it's basically repeated again in, in Psalm 53. The, those same three verses are pretty much repeated there. There's none that doeth good. You take the best of them. Isaiah said that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. There's none that doeth good. And in, in the book of Romans, let's turn to chapter 3. In Romans, Paul is, is comparing the Jews and the Gentiles. And he comes to chapter 3. And he looks at the Jews and he looks at the Gentiles. And here's what he has to say about it. Starting with verse 9. What then are we? He's, he is a Jew. And so he's talking about the Jews. He's saying, are we the Jews better than they, they the Gentiles? No, in no wise. We have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. And then we hear, then he tells us how great man is. He says, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They're, with their tongues, they have used the seat, the poison of aspis under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and that all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We look again and again and again. Why do we need to be born again? Because we are wicked. Right. And he says, the Jews, who were supposed to be God's people, have turned away from God. I mean, if we look through the, the books of history in the Old Testament, and starting with, with Joshua and even before in, in the books, the other books, but even starting with Joshua, we see the nation of Israel. They do evil. God brings judgment upon him. They cry unto God and God delivers them. And they go along fine for a while, but then they turn back into sin. They rebel against God again. God again brings judgment upon them upon them. God brings them a deliverer when they call upon him. That cycle went over and over and over through the history of Israel. And then they said, and to begin with, God was supposed to be their king. And they came to a time when, when they said, we want a king like all the other nations. We don't want God to rule over us. We want a king. And so God chose him a king. And then which was Saul to begin with, and then David. But we look at the, the period of the kingdom, and they were there were good kings, there were bad kings. And it just they just kept going through this cycle where they would turn to God and God would deliver them, and they would turn into go back to sin, and God would bring judgment upon them until finally God had to take drive them out of the land of Israel. And he says, Paul here said that Jews and Gentiles are all the same. They're all bound up with wickedness. There have been those that have said, well, you know, it's environment. The environment, if we had a better environment, then, then 
people would be better. Now, if you, you look at the individual people, people had, have had been abused as children and, and had a rough time. And you say, well, I can understand why they turned, turned wicked and turned to, to bad things. But the Bible tells us that it, the reason we sin is because the wickedness is in us. And so God is going to prove that it's not the environment. Let's turn. We started at the beginning. Now let's go back, go to the end. Revelation chapter 20. There's, there's a saying that was prevalent back several years ago. The devil made me do it. Um, chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose a little season. And what's going on during these thousand years? At the beginning of this thousand years, Christ returns to earth, and he doesn't come as a meek servant. He comes as a king of kings and a lord of lords. And it says he will rule with a rod of iron. Man even during this thousand year reign, still has a sin nature. And your sin nature is not eradicated. Those who are living upon the earth, who, who multiply and fill the earth again after the, the things that have taken place prior to the beginning of the tribute or beginning of the millennium or the thousand year reign, they begin to multiply. And they are born with that same sin nature that each and every one of us was born with. But, God, but Jesus Christ rules with a rod of iron and, and evil is punished rapidly. And so it is kept, evil is kept in check. It's still there, but it's kept in check. Today, if we look at our, our judicial system with criminals, people murder people and they, they put into prison and they're released and they, they go right back to what they were doing before. The judgment will be quick. Today, if somebody goes to trial for murder, how long do they, before they actually are tried and then once they're tried and put in prison, then, you know, people argue against the death penalty, but God said that he who he who sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. God sanctioned the death penalty. But during this thousand years, Jesus Christ rules with a rod of iron, and people are, and wickedness is kept in check. Now, what happens at the end of this thousand years? People now have, everybody knows about Jesus Christ. Everybody knows the gospel. Not everybody accepts the gospel, but everybody knows it. The Bible says, they shall not say, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least to the greatest. So everybody knows, but not everybody obeys. So we come to the end of that. Let's, let's start with verse 4. And I, I saw thrones and they set upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Then we come to the end of the thousand years, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, 
and shall go out to deceive the nations which are on the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So here we see Satan gathering men who have refused to accept peacefully the reign of Christ. He comes out that good, Jesus Christ is physically on the earth. People know him. What, what life is like going, going to be like then, I don't know. But we know that it will be a rule of righteousness. But there are so many people that have, have multiplied that have refused to accept Jesus Christ. And so Satan comes and he, he's loose out of his prison and he goes out and deceives the nations. And he says, together they are the, the number of the sand of the sea. And, the, and they are coming up to fight against the Lord Jesus Christ. They form a big army and they come against Jesus Christ and, and his people. The four quarters of the earth, Magog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. And they went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Very quick battle. Yeah. And you know, the word of God is going to be prevalent. They can open their the Bible and look at that and see what's going to happen to them. But that doesn't mean they believe. It. They think they can defeat the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's a short battle. So even, even after a perfect reign, a perfect environment, and still man's heart has turned to evil. Now, coming back to the, the new birth, <clears throat> just very briefly, when, before a person is saved, he has one nature, and that is sin nature. When a person is saved, is born again, he receives the Holy Spirit. And now you think, well, now that he has the Spirit of God, there's going to be peace. But the problem is, now we have another battle within. We have the old nature, and we have the new nature. Right. And there's a battle going on within each and every one of us. So that Paul says, the things that I would, I do not. And the things I would not, those I do. Therefore, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So even though we have the new nature, we still have the old nature, and there's that battle going on in each and every one of us. That doesn't mean that we should think that the new nature is, or that the, the, the new birth is something bad. It is good, but it gives us a chance to fight, and there is a hope of victory. And eventually, there's going to come a time when the old nature will be eradicated. Of course, as long as we're on this earth, we're going to have to fight that, that old nature. But eventually, we will be released from that old nature and we'll have only the new nature as we stand in the presence of God. So let's turn back to, to where we started from in, in John chapter 3. The fair, and they, let's start at the beginning of the chapter again. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Let's look at Nicodemus for a minute. Nicodemus says he came to Jesus by night. Now, why did he come at night? I believe that. There was a questioning in him, and he, he was looking, and he said, 
He says that Jesus, we know that they were to teach or come from God. I believe that there was a seeking within Nicodemus. He was looking for the truth. Now, there were, there were those religious leaders who were absolutely out against Jesus and were seeking to destroy him. But I don't think Nicodemus was among those. I think he was truly looking for the truth. He didn't understand. He says, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. There were come some people that came to him and they, they would say things to him that were simply trying to trick or to trap Jesus in his words. I don't think that was the case with Nicodemus. Jesus answered unto to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now this, this was a new concept that had not been taught before. And so it, it's confusing. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? It just, it just sounded preposterous to him. How can I be born again? I'm, I'm a big man and I can't go back into my mother's womb and be born again. What, what are you talking about? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Um, there's somewhat of a controversy about what it's talking about as water here. One thing I'll say definitely is not talking about water baptism. Because water baptism is not necessary. Now it, is, it is commanded and is preferable. But if you look at Jesus hanging on the cross, he was standing, he was hanging between two thieves and they were ridiculing him and then the one turns to the other and says we're, we, we shouldn't ridicule him because we're in the same condemnation he is and he turns to Jesus and he says remember me when you come into your kingdom and Jesus said today shalt thou be with me in paradise was he baptized no the so baptism is not necessary for salvation Salvation is through faith. Baptism is a work. So baptism is not necessary for salvation. So this cannot be talking about baptism. What is a popular belief, and I think is probably the correct one about the water, is that it's referring to physical birth, as when a person is born, or before they're born, they're contained in amniotic fluid, but before they're born, that fluid is, is broken. So born of water, I think, refers to the physical birth. And then, so born, it's a contrast here. You have to be born physically, and you have to be born spiritually in order to see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's the water birth. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Then he says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. We don't understand how the spirit works. But once we receive the spirit, we can feel the spirit working within us and guiding us and teaching us. Um, Bible tells us that the things of the spirit are, are taught to us by the spirit. A person who is not saved does not have the spirit dwelling within them. They can read the Bible and they can see the words but they, they do not have the teacher to teach them. We who are saved, as we read the Bible, we, we have the Holy Spirit guiding us and teaching us. After all, the Holy Spirit is the author of the scriptures, where it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 
that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us as we read his word. So this is another benefit of the new birth, or the being born again, born of the Spirit. Let's go to one other passage before we quit. First John chapter five. Starting with the beginning of the verse, whoso believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Here again, we talk about the new birth. His Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that loveth, let me back up, and everyone that loveth him that begat, he loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, whom we love. When we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that can overcometh the world, even our faith. The new birth comes by faith, and through faith we can overcome the world. That, Like I said, we still have the old nature in us, and there's still a daily battle, or we could even say it hourly or even minute by minute battle that goes in on in our lives that we have the power within us to have victory through the new birth through the power of the holy spirit which dwells within us 